Hi, welcome to the Fit and Healthy Today Show. And today we're going to discuss prostate cancer. I've got some statistical data, the causes, and then the supplements that I hope will help either prevent or if you have prostate cancer, help reduce the symptoms or the metastasizing, that means the spreading of the prostate cancer within the body. Um, second leading cause of death in men, and 80% of all cases are in men 65 and above. Now what's also interesting is that 80% of all men 80 years old and above have some very slow moving type of prostate cancer. So very prevalent obviously as we grow older and it obviously increases, the risk increases as we grow older as well in men. Um, it is also increased with men that have had sexually transmitted diseases or who have had multiple partners and we don't know exactly the reason why other than maybe because of the inflammatory aspects on the prostate. The causes. There's a multitude of causes and there's probably some here that I've not even mentioned and some we just plain and simple don't know about. The biggest, biggest thing that we do believe is hormone imbalances between estrogens, progesterones, and testosterone. Um, these imbalances, depending on how the diet is and how the body converts various testosterone potentially into dehydrotestosterone, how much the estrogens affect the prostate, all those types of things, that balance is what will cause prostate inflammation and thereby possibly lending itself to causing prostate cancer. We, um, research has supported some other things as well as, as contributing uh, factors. Um, pesticides, herbicides, and chemical exposures. Now most of these obviously cause, cause a mutation of the cells or are petrochemical types of herbicides or pesticides that lend themselves to dehydrotestosterone or estrogen dominance. Uh, in the prostate area lending itself then to prostate cancer. But the chemical exposure also too because of the altering of the specific DNA and RNA on a cellular level in the body. And here in the United States we have over 3,000 different types of chemicals approved of in our food, for our food usage. Some of which are carcinogenic, but they don't seem to do much about it. Nutritional deficiencies, zinc deficiencies, selenium deficiencies, lack of vitamin B's, lack of vitamin C's, nutritional deficiencies because our foods just don't have it anymore. We don't use sustained organic types of farming anymore. We overuse fields, we drain the fields and then use chemical fertilizers and pesticides on top of it. Our food basically is extremely nutritionally deficient. So you can't get it from your foods. If your doctor said that 75 years ago to you, Probably not anymore. 40% um, increase in heavy meat eaters, more than one serving of meat uh, per day. So if you like your steaks and your burgers and all that stuff multiple times throughout the day on a daily basis, 40% risk increase. And we think that it's because of prostaglandin 1 production increases uh, inflammatory issues um, in the prostate. Um, when you have a low fiber, low fruit and vegetable type of diet and you eat a lot of junk, sugar, white flour, pasta, starches, remember cancer thrives in an oxygen deprived environment and fruits and vegetables tend to alkali and oxygenate our bodies. So if you're eating the good old fast food diet, your risk factors have greatly increased uh, when it comes to prostate cancer. Family history, particularly if it's a father that had it or a brother that had it. And where we really want to pay attention to that is if the father or brother had it early on. So in your 40s and 50s, because those tend to be, that type of cancer tends to be a little bit more, actually can be a lot more aggressive forms. Obviously if you have a father that sustained it when he was 80 years old or in his 80s, you know, your chances are good you're going to have it anyway, but not the aggressive forms that we worry about significantly. Black American men have two times the risk. We don't know why. It's just when we do the statistical data, they have a much greater chance. And it doesn't seem the dietary issues and all of that, we don't know the reason why. It just is what it is. Excessive calcium, particularly non-fat milk products. The reason why is, number one, they have no magnesium for the calcium to absorb. And excessive amounts of calcium, I see doctors recommending calcium carbonate and calcium, calcium, calcium continually, but too much calcium depletes vitamin D. And one of the main things that is very anti-prostate cancer is vitamin D, anti-prostate cancer, anti-breast cancer. I know Ralph has discussed all the studies that have come out on vitamin D. 
Therefore, please limit your gulping of the milk consumption, eat a little bit of cheese and that kind of stuff, but excessive amounts of milk products raise your risk of prostate cancer. Statin drugs. Those are the cholesterol-lowering drugs that everybody seems to want to take. 50% increase in prostate cancer risk, and if you've been on them five years or more, 80%. You take the statin drugs only when nothing else works, because if you've got any of these other factors and you add statin drugs on top of that, there we go. Not a good thing or to have if you want to keep your risk factors down. Diet. Man, you know, I think <laughs> we talk about diet, and I could almost probably just co cut, copy, and paste the diet necessary for, to maintain good health. But with prostate, we want to see at least two servings of cooked tomatoes per week, watermelon and red, gr red grapefruit, and the reason why, and, and salmon as well. You know, notice how they all have a pink or red color? They're rich in something called lycopene. And lycopene, in clinical studies, it's been shown to be extremely anti-prostate cancer. So you can buy it in supplement form as well. Um, 20 to 40 milligram dosages are what we know uh, lend themselves to help. But eat, eat these types of things in your diet. Eat nuts and seeds and clean fish sources. You know, no more than one fish a, day, uh, fish a week because we have to worry about mercury content. But, and look for fish that obviously tend to have less mercury stores. Those are all rich in essential fatty acids which are very anti-inflammatory. Reduction of inflammation keeps cancer risk down. Eat lots of organic alkali forming fruits and vegetables, five to seven servings a day. Okay? With everything we talk about, we talk about eating that much fruits and vegetables, and even our government says you need them. You need to alkali the blood in order to keep cancer risk down. And then based upon what we read before, limit your red meat and dairy consumption. Obviously, you know, you're having the family barbecue, that's one thing, but if you're sitting there doing a, a burger every day and then going home and having your nice stew, eh, it's too much red meat. Okay, now, all the supplements I have listed here all have studies to back them up. So if your docs say there's nothing to support that, they're wrong, okay? And hopefully they've read, because the majority of these have been in their medical journals, so hopefully they've read about them. Besides vitamin D, because we know vitamin D actually halts prostate cancer cell production. It slows it way down. The same with breast cancer in women. Keep it a minimum of 2,000 IUs. Some doctors are running the test for vitamin D. If you're deficient, you can take like 5,000 IUs for a month to 60 days to build up your vitamin D reserves. Selenium. 200 micrograms of an organic source, and I'm not talking about going down to your local um, department grocery store and grabbing selenium. We need an organically bound, naturally occurring selenium for a 67% reduction in prostate cancer. 67%. It's because our soils, once again, they're no longer rich in selenium. And selenium is a, 200 micrograms is very little, is a trace mineral that we require to fight off cancer and help with our immune system. Pomegranate juice and seeds, eight ounces a day, or you can buy the seeds themselves in a dehydrated form, were found more effective than Proscar. Now, a lot of doctors, if you have swollen prostate or you know, you're having that frequent urination or you have a prostate cancer risk, they'll put you on Proscar. Thousand bucks a year. And a lot of that's not covered by insurance. It only prevented one case in 71 men in seven years. That ain't too much. That, that's not worth the money at all. When you can turn around, and, and along with the side effects, which are impotence libido. Not a good thing for guys to have, trying to reduce the prostate cancer with these types of side effects. So the pomegranate juice was found as effective, I should say actually more effective than Proscar, a very expensive drug. Lycopene we discussed, but when you combine lycopene with vitamin E, vitamin E activates lycopene. Lycopene is a fat soluble uh, nutrient, and so when you combine them together, the anti-cancer effect is activated. Uh, capsation or cayenne. Now this is the cayenne, um, you know, is a pretty hot pepper. Capsation is what gives jalapenos, habanero, what gives the hot peppers their heat. And you can buy supplements that, that will say on there with the cayenne pepper 300,000 HU. That's a, a heat unit measurement. But uh, reduced uh, risk by 80% in mice, uh, cedar cyanide, research on that one. And it also showed in a Spanish study that when, once you had the prostate tumors that were cancerous, it 
obviously based upon the research to slow the further development of those tumors. So if you li like hot and spicy cayenne types of stuff or you want to supplement with that, please, by all means, it also aids digestion as well. Green tea, 12 cups a day. That's, that's a lot of green tea. So there are um, EGCG types of products that, where you would take like three capsules a day. And it reduced the biomarkers by 10 to 90%. Those are the measurements that doctors use to help determine whether or not you have or may have prostate cancer. And we'll talk about that a little further. Shark cartilage. Now, there's a lot of research going on in cancer of something called anti-angiogenesis or angiogenesis inhibitors. And what that does is that prevents the spread of prostate cancer or other cancers in the body. So oftentimes, you know, you'll get a doctor that will be very reluctant to remove tumors. Well, when they're reluctant to remove tumors, it's because they're afraid of this an angiogenesis effect. So what shark cartilage, green tea also is anti-angiogenesis, it slows the growth of tumors and prevents the metastasizing of prostate cancer to other parts of the body. CoQ10 oxygenates the blood. And if you're on that Lipitor, Zocor, the statin drugs, you better be taking 100 milligrams of the very best CoQ10. And I'm not talking about a uh, drugstore brand. I'm talking about a good Japanese source. Because it oxygenates and it also aids. When you oxygenate, once again, you lower cancer risk. Garlic. Garlic. You know, maybe the Italians have less amount of prostate cancer, believe it or not. And so... Garlic, particularly aged garlic, there is a brand, brand called Kaolic, but there's other aged garlics that have clinical data that shows it inhibits cancer growth. A good multiple vitamin, since we have hardly no nutrients in our food, uh, we have calories, but no nutrients, a good multiple vitamin that hopefully has a little bit higher selenium, at least 100 micrograms, and if you've got prostate cancer risk, you want to add an additional amount. Ester C. Well, doctors always say C has no effect on cancer. They're wrong. It inhibits the spread of prostate cancer cells. Zinc and copper reduce DHT, which is dehydrotestosterone, which we believe could be a contributing factor to prostate cancer. Now, this is Hans Nieper is a famous um, cancer researcher. And what he found basically was this herb that comes out of South America, once again, is an angiogenesis inhibitor. Essential fatty acids. Now, we talked about them in diet. But you can take them supplement-wise. So if you're not a big nut eater and you're not a big fish eater, you can get the 3,000 to 4,000 milligrams of, flash, of flax or fish oil, and that lowers your cancer risk, uh, colon cancer risks, prostate cancer risks, because once again, it's an anti-inflammatory. Turmeric extract activates a enzyme called P53. Um, it's a cancer control gene, gene that basically will slow the effect or it slowed the spread of cancers as well. Turmeric has been researched on so many different forms of cancer, but it's also given oftentimes as a COX-2 inhibitor for inflammation. There's this commercial on TV that bugs me, and it tells you to call in and get it, and it's a beta cisisterol. Come in, and it's 100 times more effective than saw palmetto. Please don't buy it. And the reason why is it elevates the risk of prostate cancer. If you're going to do something, do saw palmetto for prostate in enlargement. But don't do beta cisterols. They're too heavy of a concentration, and they contribute to prostate cancer. There's a, a list of other herbs here that you can write down that you need to kind of not do a lot of. Obviously, cinnamon can be an issue. Uh, cinnamon, uh, we, I know we use to help lower blood sugars. But the problem is that it is also contains uh, high sources of beta cisterol. Watchful waiting. Now, more and more studies are starting to back that with prostate cancer, particularly in men age 65 and above in non-aggressive forms, we just monitor it. We look at a couple of readings, which Ralph mentioned la uh, a couple weeks ago on the HSP27, which me measures that angiogenesis I, talk I talked about, which means whether the cancer is spreading, in combination with the Gleason, re Gleason reading. PSA is not a good indicator of prostate cancer. It's only an indicator of prostate swelling. But watching these, we found, just watching these without doing the radical removal and, and all the, the um, radiation and all of that, watching these um, oftentimes, because this slow progressive uh, types of prostate cancer can take 25 to 30 years to kill you. Anyway, now we're going to be moving on to the fitness portion of our show. Thank you very much. Hi, welcome 
to the fitness portion of our show and in our continuing series on this we're going to be working on the fourth chakra which is the heart and obviously that would be the sense of compassion and empathy for other people when you are lacking that what comes out is you're going to be uncaring unfeeling they tend to be abusers of alcohol and drugs as well they lack oftentimes self-love as well too hateful selfish jealous confused and obviously the balance of that one involves the giving, the caring, the compassion that we have. And, and that is a very balanced energy for both male and females. There's two exercises that I'm going to show you regarding that. And one is called angel wings, which is kind of appropriate because you're going to find my, my arms flapping all over the place. Your arms come out um, and feet are just about shoulder width apart. Your arms come out. You kind of wind them around. You're going to have a slight bent to your torso bring them out and then I like to bring it around if you have shoulder problems just bring it off to the side now this could affect rotator issues so if you have rotator problems this may not be an exercise that you might want to do the next one is called the triangle now remember if you're noticing all the energy is moving across this way which is through the heart the next one's called the triangle and what happens is, is you put your feet out a little bit wider than shoulder width you're going to reach up to the sky and you're going to gradually go down and you're going to look upward and this is a position that you can hold for I would like to see 10 to 30 seconds gradually come up then we do the same thing we put the arm up I like the arm up first and then we gradually go up some variations on this are have it to have the arms out and tilt it like a teapot those are two exercises give them a try for the next couple of weeks and see if we can't warm the heart in these colder days Thank you, and next we'll be moving on to the research portion of our show. Welcome to the research portion of our show, and with us today, as always, is our researcher, Ralph Torciano. Ralph? And thank you very much for the intro. Mm -hmm. Now, we all heard of the Spanish flu, the 1918 flu, and we always heard about the extremely high death rate brought on by this flu. Well, researchers have discovered something which kind of adds additional angle to what we call the Spanish flu and why the death rate was so high. What if it wasn't actually the flu itself that did the killing? but the way they treated the flu that contributed to its extremely high death rate. Well, what they discovered, this came in the November 1st issue of Clinical Infectious Diseases. What they said, what the article suggests, that it was a surprising factor in that high death toll. What was it? The misuse of aspirin. And this is their quote, so I'm gonna go through the article real slowly, so basically my words cannot be misconstrued. High aspirin dosing levels used to treat patients during the 1918 to 1919 pandemic are now known to cause, in some cases, toxicity and a dangerous buildup of fluid in the lungs. Remember how the Spanish flu used to kill? Fluid in the lungs, which may have contributed to the incidence and severity of symptoms bacterial infections, and mortality. Yes, just from the misuse of aspirin. Additionally, autopsy reports from 1918 are consistent with what we know today about the dangers of aspirin toxicity, as well as the expected viral causes of death. They said the motivation behind the improper use of aspirin is a cautionary tale, said the author of the article called Karen Starko. In 1918, physicians did not fully understand either dosing or pharmacology of aspirin, yet they were willing to recommend it. Sound familiar with stuff today? Certain medications and vaccines being rushed to market without fully understanding how they work or whether they work? It was promoted by the drug industry, endorsed by doctors wanting to do something, and accepted by families and institutions desperate for hope. Again, 
They put it to cautionary tale. I lead with this article first because data is extremely important. Words are nice, they make people feel happy, but in the end, you have to have it backed up by documented studies. All right, so keep in mind, aspirin and the Spanish flu. Now, a fairly good study on something called resveratrol. Resveratrol is actually taken again from your nose, grapes and wine, you'll hear from things along those lines, but resveratrol is quickly moving up the ladder as to one of the number one supplements that are out there. In this case, this study came out of the publication of Endocrinology, a journal of the Endocrine, Endocrine Society. What they discovered is resveratrol had an incredible effect on controlling diabetes. Through this hormone, I should say, there were a protein called serotins. And what they found out is when resveratrol was taken internally, it actually began to mimic calorie restriction. And remember, we all hear about the lower number of calories you have, the longer you live. But they found out just by not restricting the calories, but adding something, it began to have that impact all along those lines by producing that protein called serotin, S-I-R-U-T-I-N. And the fact is, to test their hypothesis, they even took resveratrol, sounds kind of bad, and injected it directly into the brains of rodents to see if it had the actual impact itself. And yes, the brain tissue actually did produce this class of proteins, which are extremely beneficial for type 2 diabetics called serotins itself. Something to keep in mind as far as a new type of strategy for treating type 2 diabetes. Again, the Journal of Endocrinology. Kind of interesting, kind of neat. Something to look at, especially when looking at supplements to purchase. Now, antidepressants being used a lot. Now they're starting to give them to kids for pain relief. Well, the American Gastroenterological Association, excuse the pronunciation, the AGA, just discovered at least for digestive disorders, where it's being highly recommended and basically sold to children, it is no better than a placebo. Quote unquote. So basically they said antidepressants and placebo are equally effective in child pain relief, meaning antidepressants are non-effective. Be safer to give your child a sugar pill. At least in those cases, the side effects are going to be a lot less than with something from an antidepressant. What they did was this. Doctors designed a large perspective, multi-center, randomized, placebo-controlled trial in which children ages 8 to 17 with IBS or abdominal functional pain or dyspepsia were randomized to four weeks of placebo or the antidepressant. Of the 83 children who completed the study, 63% of those who took the antidepressant reported feeling better. Sounds good. While 5% reported feeling worse. Of the patients given the placebo, 57.5% fell better, but only 2.5% fell worse. When in doubt, try a placebo with your child first. You may find it quite constructive and a heck of a lot of less side effects. Now, another article along those lines doesn't deal with psychotherapy. It was called Where is the Science? A Story of Psychotherapy. This came out of the Psychological Science in the Public Interest Journal. And the reason this was important is because I've seen a lot of antidepressants being utilized and drugs being pushed without what they called cognitive behavioral therapy. Why this one thing you hardly ever hear of, CBT? Because it's been shown to be much more effective than an antidepressant, which can have a relapse rate and at least regards depression of up to 50% after its use. CBT is the gold standard. And what these psychotherapists are trying to do is to get people to utilize this, especially in case of post-traumatic stress syndrome. In fact, most psychologists are not even trained in it. And when they did look at it, the one the 30% that we're aware of it, only half of them chose the option of using cognitive behavioral therapy because it took time. They said, quote unquote, they said, that means that six out of seven sufferers were not getting the best care available. Turn that around, that means you only have a one in seven chance, if you're suffering from some sort of stress disorder, of getting the proper care. Not a drug, the proper care. And they're basically reporting and they're trying to encourage that they got to get these uh, psychotherapists from out of the for-profit centers and basically using the treatment and get it done right. Otherwise, you become addicted to these medications the rest of your life. Now, what if I told you 
There was something in your home that affects your central nervous system, visual, sensory, cardiovascular systems, eyes, skin, liver, and so forth, and kidneys. And it's ex your children are extre extremely susceptible to the dangers of this one element. What have I told you? There are hundreds of thousands of homes with this toxin emitting from their walls on a daily basis and the government is unwilling to do a single thing about it. In fact, if anything, they want to punish you if you even bring it to the attention of your insurer. Well, what is it? Drywall. What happened was China has shipped tons of contaminated drywall to the United States, about 500 million pounds of it alone. And it was all junk, contaminated with other materials, specifically with something called strontium sulfide, hydrogen sulfide. Let's go down the list. Iron sulfide, sulfuric acid, sulfur dioxide, carbon disulfide, butanothionol, carbonyl sulfide, mercapitins, methylpyridine, sulfurous acid, and also now they discovered may be radioactive. Well, this goes to the story of what happens in Florida because insurers are refusing and denying insurance to have this stuff taken out of the homes. The government itself is not doing a single thing about it. In fact, if you went to your insurer and you complained you were getting sick because of your home because of this poison drywall imported from China, they cancel your insurance. Totally. Now here's the kicker. No insurance on your home, guess what happens next? It gets foreclosed upon. You lose your home. No mercy, no reimbursement, no nothing. In fact, what they said, quote unquote, that is 500 million pounds of Chinese gypsum, which came to the United States between 2001 and 2008. Uh, basically, they have done literally nothing. And they said the homeowners have little recourse since neither the Chinese manufacturers nor the Chinese government are likely to respond to any lawsuits or reimburse them for that defective drywall itself. Thanks, China. In fact, no law prevents companies from even canceling policies because of Chinese drywall. Even if a homeowner does not file a claim over the drywall, it remains, it remains covered. They could be later denied a claim for a fire or another calamity if insurance investigators determine the home contained undisclosed Chinese drywall. Well, listen people, the part of the problem is, is this. Let's look at China. We had highly radioactive metals shipped to us, contaminated foods, pet foods, cough syrups filled with antifreeze, toys poisoned with lead, prescription drugs contaminated with other elements, uh, your building materials, counterfeit products including it's time we start really looking at these Chinese goods coming to this country. And guess what? This drywall, which is poisoning our people here in the United States, is not listed in China and is not found in Germany, where the company which owns this Chinese company is headquartered. Well, that enters our research segment for today. And thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ralph. Very good. Sounds like it needs some world court involvement. Um, thank you very much for joining our show. Research, look into this stuff for yourself. Thank you very much.